you just never know how, what life is going to take in, especially in the Air Force. And, you know, after I commissioned uh, uh, as a second lieutenant here at the UW, again, I got uh, picked up for pilot training. And so I, uh, I went to uh, Vance Air Force Base in Enid, Oklahoma for a, uh, and it's called undergraduate pilot training. And it's a year long, uh, a very, very intense training. Okay. Um, it is just, you eat, sleep, drink pretty much 24-7 uh, for that full year of learning to become a pilot. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very stressful. It, it's, a, it's a very fun, too, in a lot of ways. But, uh, um, you know, you're, you're competing with uh, all your flight mates. You know, competing isn't necessarily the right word because... Uh, yeah, but we it's all a wanted to graduate. Competition, and, but still, you're you're still trying to beat them out, right? For well, rank. And, I, I never, I, honest to God, and, and people might laugh at this and say I'm a liar, but I, honest to God, I never looked at it as a competition. Yeah. I just wanted to to graduate and do my best. Mm -hmm. And if you do your best, it's going to shake out, um, right? You're going to get the plane that you probably deserved, right? And, right. And if you don't try your best, you're going to get the plane that you probably right. deserve. Uh, so, you know, and everybody, you know, there was nobody that was a slacker, you know, and, you know, that, that person isn't trying hard. Everybody is, is trying their best. Did I ever feel overwhelmed? Uh, I did. Um, that was first, uh, about the month two, I, you know, the first six weeks or so are academics and that's academics. You're learning stuff. It's, it's, it's new, but it's not terribly, terribly hard. Uh, the pressure was there. When we started on the flight line and you're actually starting to fly, that's where I was like, wow, I'm really not the big fish in the pond anymore at all. And um, I remember me and my buddy, who was my best friend at the time, I was over at his, at his house and we were studying all together and we we're looking at, I'm not even going to name the plane, but it's a plane that not everybody really wanted too much. And he had a picture of, I'm like, if someone would just say that you're going to pass and we'll give you this plane right here, I'll, I'll take it. I just want my wings, right? Because we were so overwhelmed at the time and uh, we just wanted to graduate, you know. And as time went on and you start doing better, like, okay, now, you know, I, I think I'm going to get through or I hope I do. But you never know. You don't know until the very end. And I think there was a guy who literally washed out, like, on his last flight. I remember, yeah, he was, like, literally done and something... He just lost it or something. And uh, so you, you never felt comfortable ever for that year. And then even beyond that, you're always being evaluated in the Air Force uh, pretty much. You, you can never, you should never feel comfortable. So I remember a lot about my first flight. They call it your dollar ride in the Air Force. And the reason why they call it a dollar ride is because it's tradition to give your instructor a dollar. And you kind of do some some funny things with this dollar. You write in the, and put some other stuff uh, on this dollar and, and then you hand it to them afterwards. And I was feeling pretty confident that, you know, I would get through my dollar ride. It's pretty much a, it, it's not a super stressful one because they don't expect much from you, right? It's just, hey, uh, this one's not a freebie, but kinda. And uh, I remember my instructor, Captain Dan uh, Greenwood, his, his call sign was Dagwood. And uh, I always thought of him as, uh, if you remember the movie Platoon, he looked like, uh, oh, I uh, can't remember his name. No, I got it. I might have to start that over because I got to think of that guy's name. But. All right, so I remember a lot about my first flight in a jet at pilot training. It was in a jet called the T-37 Tweet. It was with the, the call sign of that jet is, and it, it made this really high-pitched sound. Uh, but uh, my dedicated uh, instructor was uh, our flight commander. He was this really intense guy, like just, just made everybody like, oh my gosh, really nervous. His name was Captain Dan uh, Dagwood Greenwood. And I'm friends with him to this day, which is crazy. If you would have told me that when we started uh, pilot training, I'm like, you're crazy. But he looked like Tom Berenger from Platoon. And uh, he was just all intense. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to fly with this guy, right? And uh, so we go up on our first day and it's Enid, Oklahoma in the summer and it is hot. And the T-37, it had an air conditioner in name only. Uh, so we're up there, and I remember we'd have to fly this departure. If I remember right, it was at 5,000 feet, and I think you went out at 250 knots or something like that. 
And I'm like, oh, yeah, again, again, I kind of know how to fly a little bit. I should be all right. So I'm flying, and, and uh, I would get like 50 feet off altitude. So I'd be like 5,050 feet. And he'd be like, you're too high. And he'd take the stick and push it over. And, and, and I'd get off altitude. You're too high. Get on altitude. Get on altitude. I puked. <laughs> I puked all over the place. I think I puked three times on that flight. I, I did make it in the bag each time. You carry bags with you. And uh, so, yeah, it wasn't, we didn't get to do uh, the loops and the aileron rolls on that first flight because I was sicker than a dog the whole flight. And uh, that's nerve wracking. You come back and it's like, well, about half the guys and girls uh, on their first ride, they, they do end up throwing up. And I was part of that half, unfortunately. Um, but yes, yeah, so it was, uh, it was very intimidating, very memor memorable. And then my second flight, I threw up again, but that was the last time. That's the last time I've thrown up an airplane. Thank goodness. So as I progressed after those first couple flights that were, uh, were not so good, you know, you get used to it. I had a little routine to make sure, at least in my mind, and they tell you in the air force that air sickness is all in your mind. And it, and it probably is because yeah, you're really nervous on those flights. It's hot and uncomfortable. You're in a strange environment. But as you get, get comfortable with it, you stop thinking about that. And uh, I remember I had this little routine, and it's just it's messing with your own mind, right? Like I would, I would eat crackers and a Sprite. And that was my magic crackers and Sprite. I was not going to puke if I had my crackers and, and Sprite. And I did that for about, you know, the next dozen flights or whatever, and then you kind of don't do that anymore, right? Be, but in your mind, though, that was a magical pack, uh, crackers and, and, and Sprite. Um, but after that, you're, you're all practicing, you know, now I am going up and doing loops and aileron rolls and other acrobatics. You're doing all these landings and other navigation. And then you eventually start uh, even flying formation with another flight, you know, kind of like what people would look at the Thunderbirds or the Blue Angels. And while we're not flying uh, quite like that, it is very similar actually, you know, just but in a two ship. So you have two planes instead of the Thunderbirds will have four or six a lot of the times. So uh, how close you are, they, they, they say that you're by the visual, uh, you use visual uh, uh, alignment and your wings, if my thumbs are the wings, you, you're offset like this, um, but it's three feet. You're three feet from the other airplane. Now you're a little bit farther than that. That's if you were if you're no kidding, a beam, but you're offset a little bit, but it's still very close. Like you can, like if, if someone put up a dollar, you could tell that was a dollar as opposed to a $5 bill probably, you know, you're that close. It depends on the plane too, like a T-37 and a T-38, they're a little bit smaller wings. A-10, uh, that's much bigger wings, but I could probably, probably still tell if it was a dollar versus a $100 bill or something like that. So you're very close. So when I started flying formation, it was maybe the first time that I did something, uh, at least in pilot training, that, wow, I got back and I felt like I, I am terrible at this. I, I am just, I could not do it. And my instructor, he was just like, yeah, you're doing this. He was actually pretty cool about it or whatever. And I'm just, you're out there and you're just, you know, if this is the, the lead and I'm the wingman, which is that's what you are a lot on your first flight, is that's where the the more the skill is, I'm just up there, boom, boom, in and out, up and down. I'm like, oh my God, I, what am I doing here? And uh, I, I just felt like I completely failed. Like, oh my God, I'm, he's going to fail me. And we get down, back down to the desk. He's like, yeah, you did pretty good out there. I'm like, I, I did? He's like, yeah, it was your first flight. What do you expect? Uh, first flight is a formation, right? Like, well, I don't know. All these other guys and girls are, you know, I was probably, uh, I wasn't the first one to fly formation out of our flight, but they'd come back. Um, and the, the, the people who did were like, oh, that was the most fun and blah, blah, blah. It was great. And so I'm like, oh, this must not be too hard. Well, I was really hard on myself. Like, oh my gosh, this was really hard. And I stunk. Uh, but it turned out that I actually was pretty decent at it. And, and I ended up loving it. I love flying formation. And I wish I could still do it today. Uh, I would do it in a heartbeat. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And it's very challenging, but uh, it's a lot of fun. So in pilot training, you don't have a personal life. Uh, I was married and I had a small, she was a year old at the time. And, and my wife was wonderful. Uh, did, a, did a pretty good job of prepping her before like, hey, you know, this is, and she, 
her, she'd never been in the military or known anybody in the military. And, um, but, okay, this is how it's going to be. I'm going to come home at night and after a 12 hour day, cause every day was a 12 hour day. It, it was, uh, it, um, and I mean, a 12 hour at the, at the office, right? Office at the flight line flying and, and doing academics and, and whatnot. I said, I'm going to come home. I'm going to eat something 30 minutes and then I'm going to study and, uh, and then I'm going to go to bed. And, and she's like, okay. And, 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 and she did really good with that. I mean, not all wives can, can do really good with that, you know, especially with the little, little one. Um, and I did do a pretty good job. Uh, I realized that you really can't do it 24, seven, 365. Um, and about that point that I was getting overwhelmed, I was just stressing myself out. And I finally decided that I, I, I needed to take a break. So I decided on Saturdays, I'm going to put everything away and spend it with my family. And that actually was a pretty good turning point um, in my performance and just my mental health, if you want to, want to call it that, because uh, I was so stressed out <laughs> before that. Uh, you know, you're just, you're just trying to keep your head above water. But I'm like, you know what, either I can do this or I can't. I'm not going to wash myself out, because um, I was. I was just getting drained. I, oh my gosh, you know, you think about something constantly, you know, it, it, it's going to wear on anybody. So I did that and it was great. Uh, you know, we, we would go do things on Saturdays, uh, uh, my wife and, and, and my daughter, or, and uh, it, it turned out to be just a really good mental um, reset every week. So yeah, I remember the first time that I, I flew the T-38 and, uh, you know, never flown anything with an afterburner for it. For those who don't know what afterburner is, it's essentially all you're doing is dumping gas into the exhaust, just raw gas into the exhaust. What happens? And that exhaust is hot, right? So it creates an explosion. So it's kind of like a rocket in a way. And uh, so you use it for takeoff every time. So you go to just normal, regular, full power, and then you go over the hump. Um, and both those afterburners kick in, and it does. It pushes you back in the seat, and, uh, and you're rolling, and, it's, and things start happening really, really fast. And that was the difference coming from the T-37. That was still fast, faster than a, than a Cessna 172, but now you're going an order of magnitude faster, and your brain takes a while to catch up. I remember that first time, it was actually in the sim, when you, when you, when you take off in this thing, and it's like, you put the gear and the flaps up and all of a sudden you're like five miles away from the airport and you're like, I, I you have no idea where you are. All of a sudden you're five miles away from the airport and uh, you're like, I'm never going to be able to do this. But again, it's, it's interesting how the human brain works. It adapts. And uh, I'd probably, if I went up in T-38 now, I'd probably be a little bit behind because I haven't flown that high performance airplane for a while, but it'd probably take me a couple flights and, and I, I, the brain adapts to it again. Yeah, so uh, after you get your wings and you know where you're going to go, so I, I, I got the A-10, and the A-10 training is in Davis Mountain Air Force Base in Tucson, Arizona. So you got to go do a couple other trainings. This, this training called uh, Introduction of Fighter Fundamentals, which is very hard and very stressful. You're flying uh, T-38s again, but you're, you're practicing fighter maneuvers, uh, BFM, basic fighter maneuvers. You're going up and, and no kidding now instead of just, hey, I'm flying around in formation, you're trying to shoot the other guy or girl down. And that is very stressful. It actually was more stressful in a lot of ways than the whole year of pilot training. Because the washout rate in that is, is extremely high also. Um, it, it, it is. Because uh, not everybody can handle that. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it was, every flight was extremely stressful. And uh, they're short. They're like 45 minute flights because you're an afterburner the whole time. Because when you dogfight, you're, you're just, you're pulling G's the whole time. And, uh, but it, it was a lot of fun though, too, in, in, a, in a weird way, um, as long as you passed your flight. <laughs> so, uh, and then you get to go out as an A-10 guy, you get to go out on the range and we would drop bombs. So of course you never dropped a bomb before. And, um, and I found that actually more difficult than, uh, uh, in a way than, than doing the, the BFM. But uh, as things happen fast on a range, you're in this little uh, um, airspace and you got to put this little bomb 
you know, hopefully somewhere <laughs> in the, the right vicinity. It t ended up, guys would come out, if, 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 uh, if you got a scorable bomb, that was a good thing. I know that doesn't really mean anything, but uh, it was very difficult to do, especially as a, as a new person doing it. As you're, you're going up at, I can't remember, like 300, 400 knots, and you go up and you come down at this target, and you, know, you hit the button, and you, you kind of hope you do it right, right? And you don't know what you're doing for the most part, but you, you end up getting pretty good at it. So the B-2 is a very unique airplane. Uh, for those who haven't seen it, it kind of looks like a boomerang or a bat wing. It doesn't look like any other airplane out there. And uh, it was interesting, like I, you know, I live in this little town like 10 minutes away from the base and even after 10 years of flying and if I was out mowing my yard and my buddy's flying over I would have to stop and and watch the B2 even though I might have just flown it earlier that morning you can't help but stop and look at it as far as how it flies you know it doesn't fly anything like the other airplanes that I flew but mostly because it's big uh, 172 feet wingspan but it flies incredibly well and you know it has a stick and you know you, you put the stick to the left and you go left you pull it back and the trees get smaller you push it forward and the trees get bigger and it, it was just it was so smooth uh and the, if you if you see a picture of the b2 it has a sawtooth on the back and basically those are all flight control surfaces and uh and those are all moving it's fly by wire so me being the dumb pilot up front yeah if i tell it to go left it'll go left but it's, those things are working like crazy back there. They're all just moving and maybe just minutely, but they're making that plane just super smooth, as smooth as any airplane that I've ever flown. And uh, it was just a dream to fly, it really was. So what makes a stealth stealth? Well, there's a lot of things. Uh, the first thing is the shape. And we kind of learned this back in the 40s. Uh, a, a experimental-ish bomber was made and it didn't do so well because the technology just wasn't there with aerodynamics and a couple of them ended up crashing and the Air Force was like, eh, this isn't so good. But during those flights, they're like, hey, this, this thing isn't showing up on radar like we expect. So they kind of, Air Force kind of kept that in the back of their mind, if you will. And when we got serious about stealth and computers caught up to all the, all the uh, flight control systems and all that, like, hey, let's try that again. And, and they did, and, uh, and it worked wonderfully. So the first thing that makes a stealth stealth is the shape. The second thing is, is what it's made out of. And uh, it's called RAM, radar absorbent materials is one of the things, there's other acronyms, but it's got some funky materials uh, that I can't talk about uh, that, that help make it stealthy. And the third thing is, is, is the mission planning, believe it or not. Um, you know, we want, if we've got good intel, then we can, well, the stealth is not invisible. It's just as less visible than other airplanes. So if we kind of know where the bad guys have their surface air missiles or their radars, hey, we can kind of use a, we kind of know what our stealth is. We can kind of plan our way around there and we can we can uh, you know, kind of make a spaghetti down like, okay, there's, a, there's something here, we're gonna go over here. And, but the bad guys think, hey, we can see all this stuff. But they can't, they can't see us because of the first two things. So we combine all those three things together and that's why we don't get seen and we're pretty safe. You mentioned the call signs. First of all, how do you get assigned a call sign? How, who makes that up? Where well, get... it's one of the, again, there's a lot of, uh, really fun, memorable moments in an Air Force career. And uh, one of just the great traditions for fighter pilots is the naming ceremony. And um, what happens is after you become mission ready, meaning that, okay, you have to, again, jump through a bunch of hoops, you have check rides, you have to do these rides. And then after you do one of these check rides, they're like, okay, if, if basically if we go to war tomorrow, Jay, you're mission ready. And you're not gonna be back, you're gonna be out there mm -hmm. flying combat missions. But that takes a while to get to that. And, um, but after you get that, then you are up to, for the next assignment night, and everybody gets into the, into the, to, to the, uh, this auditorium, you know, a bunch of like the movie seats or whatnot, and there's somebody up with a grease pencil or a, a dry erase pencil, 
and they're the scribe. And then the guy who's getting, or the girl's getting named, they have to go out of the room, and then you just people start telling stories. Like I, like I flew a J, and he forgot to put his gear down and landed gear up or something. I mean, that does that has happened, but not to me, thank God. But that might earn you a call sign if you landed with your gear up, right? Um, usually, it's something less dramatic than that. Right. But they'll tell stories, and they only have to be ten percent true, which is kind of funny. Like, <laughs> like I flew with Jay, and you know, maybe you were late putting your gear down, but you put it down, everything was fine. But I say, yeah, and he landed with his gear up. Now people would know that that was false. Right. But, but yeah, so you embellish these stories sometimes, but a lot of times you don't have to embellish them because people, you're, they're young guys and girls, right? Right. And what do young guys and girls tend to do? Stupid things. Right. And um, so a lot of people earn their call signs, or sometimes they're just based off your last name. But usually you want them to be earned, right? Something unique and funny. But yeah, they write them up on the board, and then there's this big, you know, okay, let's vote, and it goes, you know, gets pared down, and everybody's just having a great time. And there's some really funny call signs get thrown up at the board, right? And um, so, how do you get booger? <laughs> well, it's a long story. Um, it, essentially, I hope it's not I the was, obvious. A, I, it has nothing to do. With, I didn't have boogers hanging out of <laughs> my nose or something like that. Okay. But essentially, I was a booger that someone couldn't flick. And uh, and uh, um, nice. And they said, they're like, "Booger, you're booger. You're a booger. I can't flick." He was my he was the training officer, and uh, and every time I went up to fly, either my jet would break or the instructor's jet would. It was nothing, it, nothing that I was doing. I wasn't failing yeah. rides or anything. The weather, it would. It was, we had an ice storm one time, uh, just goofy stuff, and uh, so I was in this training program for a little longer than what I should have been. But again, it wasn't anything that I was doing. Uh, it was just weird stuff always happening. So he goes, uh, I, I'm in the office one day. He's like, Jesus, Bergy, you're a booger. I can't flick. His call sign was dog. I, I, this, I, this is just etched in my mind. And I look at him. I go, dog, you better not try to name me that at my naming ceremony. As the words are coming out of my mouth, you're I'm like, like no, <laughs> take, don't say that. And he goes, oh, Bergy, I wouldn't do that. And I just, like, I knew. Like, I was, like, stressed out that uh, they were going to call me booger because that's not cool, right? right. You know? You and sure enough, like, yeah. I get called booger, and uh, I was not like I, I pretended that I liked it, whatever, and uh, but I wasn't super happy about it. But um, it's kind of funny when I went to the B two, you get to you get have a naming ceremony there too, and uh, and I could have been renamed. And I actually told the ops officer, I'm like, his my ops officer's call sign was Stinky, and I'm like, Stinky, don't rename me. Everybody knows me as Booger, and I loved it by then. You know, it was yeah. three, four years later, and uh, I'm like, no, don't rename me. I'm Booger. You know, everybody, you walk in a room, it's kind of like Norm at <laughs> Cheers. You know, it's like, Booger! Hey, Booger, you know, and I'm like, yeah, you know. So, no, so no, I never wanted it changed. It wasn't happy at first, but it's, it's one of those things you never know, right? That's cool.